welcome to the UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, Six to Eight Weeks, Perspectives in Medicine. During our program, we continue to cover a variety of hot topics in the sports medicine world and more. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Six to Eight Weeks. It's just me, Brian Philly, and Drew Lansdowne. Uh, Nair Pandya is off doing something, maybe operating, maybe getting a sea urchin spine out of his foot again. Um, over the last, over the first week of training camp, there were a few meniscus injuries in the A. In, I'm just going to start that over. Um, over the first week of training camp this year, like most years, there's been a variety of different injuries. There's been some calf strains for those of us that are a little bit older. We've all experienced a calf strain and understand what Joe Burrow's going through. But I thought one of the most interesting ones was the meniscus tears that have happened. Um, first, Jalen Ramsey, cornerback for now the Dolphins, they say he's out for months, whereas the Chiefs wide receiver, Kadarius Tony had a, what they called a quick surgery to repair a partially torn meniscus Tuesday morning or last week and they say it's possible for him to be ready in about five to six weeks so it sounds like the same structure is getting injured but very different treatment programs and very different rehabilitations um, I guess my first question for you Drew is what is the meniscus and how does it tear so easily and are there signs that you worry about when you think about having a meniscus tear yeah, so the meniscus, it's a, um, like a fibrocartilage disc that sits in the knee between the uh, femur and the tibia. So it's like this soft, rubbery structure that works as a shock absorber, basically. And it protects the cartilage, the smooth lining of the joint. Um, and it distributes the load more evenly through the joint. So it's a really important structure. People used to think, you know, like 100 years ago, that it was almost like an appendix, like a vestigial structure that... Um, nobody knew why it was there. You know, if there was a problem, you just take the whole thing out and, um, you know, don't lose anything because of it. But, uh, you know, we've come to realize that it's really important. And without it, you, the knee joint starts to break down. So you start having more arthritis, more pain, more swelling. Um, it's harder to, you know, do more athletic things on the knee as a result. Um, and it, it can tear because it's it, any kind of like twisting on the knee. Um, it's, you know, just in between those two bones. And so, um, you know, over time it can get weakened. It can have degenerative changes. That's like a lot of the meniscus tears that happen. Um, or it can be, you know, you're doing something more explosive and you just cut, pivot, turn on it. And then, um, just that structure could tear like, you know, like an ACL, like any other, you know, structure in the body. Um, and it's something that, you know, if you are, um, like an elite level athlete and you have an injury to that structure where it needs to be transmitting that load to protect the surfaces and so on. Like the, the more you push it, the more the knee can swell, can be painful. So, um, can really get in the way. So the, you know, when do we worry it's, uh, when we're having, you know, swelling in the knee, especially, uh, pain with activity. Um, and then sometimes the meniscus will give you like these mechanical symptoms, like something's stuck in the joint, like there's clicking, catching, um, and all those signs like start to get concerning for us. All right. I'm going to drill down on a couple things you said. First of all, you went back to clicking. My knees click all the time. Uh, they've clicked probably since I was 25. Do I have a meniscus tear? Probably not. Um, you know, you can have some noises, some clicking. Um, some of that's normal. Some of it depends on where it is in the knee, uh, which can be hard to you know pin down totally. But uh, the meniscus, usually it'll just be this like episodic clicking, like just, you know, every now and then you catch it just right. There's a little loose piece and it can flip and click. And um, and then most of the clicking people will feel is more related to the kneecap. Um, that'll be the most common cause. Yeah, I think it's there was actually a study that came out. I think it was last year that looked at the diagnos diagnostic accuracy of people coming in with clicking and popping. And it really was no different than random chance whether or not that was going to say that you had any cartilage breakdown or any meniscus tears um so i think there are certain types of clicks especially if they're painful or they're associated with pain those can be a meniscus tear but a lot of clicks either in our knee or anywhere else in the body are just things that click and they're not things to really worry about now you said a second thing that made me a little bit concerned you said meniscus tears lead to degeneration of the knee and early arthritis. Is that sometimes true, always true, or conditionally true? It kind of depends on the meniscus tear type. Sometimes true, conditionally. 
Um, oh, it's conditionally sometimes true. Conditionally Good hedge. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so some meniscus tears, they are more or less just on the spectrum of arthritis. Like they are, you know, you have some breakdown in the joint and then the meniscus is breaking down too. Um, and then there are some tears that they don't really change the function of the meniscus. Like it's, um, you know, torn, but it's not going to cause problems to the knee joint. Um, and then there are some that, you know, like there are some that's called like a root tear or a radial tear where um, when that happens, essentially the whole meniscus function is gone. And those are, you know, at risk of more rapid degenerative changes. Um, and they get us really concerned because the knee can break down very quickly. Uh, but yeah, there's some like, like a horizontal tear, for instance, sometimes those just the way the meniscus is torn, um, it still can essentially do its whole function. All right. So I'm going to ask you another question then. So when you talk about the classic meniscus tear presentation, what are symptoms that make you think that a patient may have a meniscus tear? And what sort of symptoms may be different that make you think that it may be a more serious type of tear? Um, I think the big one, um, especially for that, you know, is this a serious tear is really swelling um, and activity related swelling. So, um, you know, every time I, you know, walk a couple of blocks or I try to go for a run, like my knee just blows up on me or at the end of the day, my knee is super swollen. Um, that's generally a sign that the knee is pretty irritated um, and can be a more significant meniscus tear. Um, another one is um, there are times where like a bigger tear can move out of place and get stuck like in, usually in the middle of the knee but like a bucket handle tear um and that's one where usually it'll be like an acute injury like i'm skiing or playing soccer i twist and um, can't fully straighten out the knee so um, if uh, people have lost range of motion um, it can be because the meniscus is just stuck there and it's physically blocking motion um, those are ones that you know we think should be treated pretty quickly because uh, can you know, it's more of a mechanical problem. You get it back into place, get it out of the way and, you know, let the joint move again. Um, and then, um, yeah, sometimes the meniscus can also give you that feeling of something locking, like, um, and that's a, probably a larger piece again, just like flipping in and out of where it should be. I think in terms of what I look for is, yeah, that locking or that feeling like I'm feeling fine 99% of the time, but then there's something that catches and it's almost like having a pebble in your shoe, um, any swelling. And like you said, that loss of range of motion when previously it was fine. Um, that swelling is oftentimes hard for people to figure out that it may just feel like a fullness in the knee, but you really feel like the pain is more in the back of the knee versus when you go to bend, you might feel like you don't have that full bending. The, that's more swelling that you can get there might be hard to do, but it doesn't feel like there's a physical block. Those meniscus tears, which we call either a bucket handle tear or a flap tear are the ones that where there's a piece of meniscus that flips up and physically stops you from being able to move. Um, I, okay. I've got one more question. We often get MRIs and when it comes back, it says you have a complex degenerative meniscus tear. Would you rather, as you enter your mid forties, early to mid forties, no, would no you worries. rather, <laughs> would you rather have a complex degenerative tear of your medial meniscus, or would you rather have a horizontal tear of your medial meniscus? Um, so, you know, just to take the complex, um, what we use that word as is just meaning it's torn in multiple different directions. Um, and so it's, you know, not like one clean tear direction. Um, I mean, I think I'd go with the horizontal tear. Um, okay. the, that can be arranged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, because that one usually doesn't change the, or we don't think it changes the like overall function of the meniscus and, um, it's, but a lot of the complex tears too, that they're not always bad. Uh, but you know, they, that's almost like it can be there, but um, depending on which area it's in, it really may not change the overall function. You could have like a perfectly healthy knee and you could see this on the imaging study, but uh, may or may not cause any problems. 
Um, so when you're seeing, um, you know, patients with a knee injury in the office, what does this usually look like? And how do you evaluate these patients um, when you're thinking, oh, maybe they have a meniscus tear? Sure. So I think when a patient comes in with any knee injury, it's always on the differential because it's something that can happen to really young patients as early as young as 12, 13, 14, all the way up into your 70s and 80s. So the first thing I usually look for is when patients have filled out questionnaires or, or what are the symptoms? And the, I kind of break it down into symptoms like you've talked about that are really concerning. Swelling, loss of range of motion, an acute injury to the knee. Um, where is their pain located? People with meniscus tears tend to localize it either to the inside where the medial meniscus is or to the outside to where the lateral meniscus is. And it should really be focused just on that joint line. It really shouldn't be something that's bouncing around a lot. Um, if it's in the front of the knee, I'm really much less concerned. If it's in the back of the knee, kind of depends if it's associated with swelling. I'm a, I'm a little bit more concerned because like we've just talked about, swelling will cause pain in the back of the knee. When I think about where patients have pain when I start actually asking them questions, they're usually pretty good at pinpointing, I have pain right along the inside of my knee for medial meniscus tears and on the outside for the lateral meniscus tears. Um, so that location of pain is really important. And activity-related pain and when that bothers them, I think is critical too, because patients with meniscus tears, frankly, for the most part, are usually okay unless they're loading the knee so they're bending the knee in a certain position and then they're twisting. So that load and twist that reproduces pain is really important. So after I get a sense of, oh, this might be a meniscus tear, the second most important thing I think is your physical exam. With a physical exam, we want to rule out anything else. So we check the ligaments, make sure all the ligaments are stable. And then there's a series of tests that we could perform. The one I like the best is just joint line tenderness. We press along the joint line where the meniscus is. And if it reproduces the pain, I'm a little bit concerned. There's a variety of other specialized maneuvers, whether it's Apley's, McMurray's, Thessaly's, all named after really old pe people at this point. In fact, they're probably all dead now. Um, and they all have different diagnostic sensitivities and specificities. And it's usually a combination of the history and the physical exam. Now, one thing uh, patients often ask is, why did I get x-rays? I'm pretty sure I have a meniscus tear. And that's really critical for a couple of reasons. One, a meniscus tear may be part and parcel with just developing degenerative changes in early arthritis in the knee. So getting an x-ray helps us look at whether or not there's early arthritis, which is really going to change management and outcomes of our management. And it's also going to help us look at other things like the alignment of the knee. Are you more predisposed to it? And these are all things we can't really get from an MRI. Um, my indications for getting an MRI are people that remain symptomatic. So people that come in, I suspect they have a meniscus tear that's going to affect their athletic performance. They're probably going to get an MRI. But if it's somebody who comes in, they've got a little bit of medial joint line pain, they haven't really tried anything, I'm not going to be as quick to getting an MRI because it's not really going to change management. And like you talked about, the red flags for when we're going to get an MRI right away, loss of range of motion, swelling with an associated meniscus tear, something that we think is going to change the natural history of the knee and make you more predisposed to getting arthritis um, down the line. Um, I think it, those people are going to be more likely to get an MRI acutely. The reason why we don't jump to getting an MRI is for better or for worse, most people don't need surgery with a meniscus tear. And the reality is, is that if you get that complex degenerative tear in your early 40s, we are more likely to be able to, more likely than not to be able to manage you non-operatively. Yeah, All right, Drew, yeah, I'm going to take you through. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's, you know, it's a really important point because, and I think some of it goes back to that, um, you know, if you MRI just a normal, well-functioning knee, like you might pick up little tears. And then, so if you say, well, now I have pain for a couple of weeks and I get an MRI, but it's not necessarily like the pain is linked to the meniscus tear. Like that was there before. And um, yet I think a lot of the times these symptoms, even if there is some tear, like, you know, the symptoms do get better. And I think a lot of people will ask too, like, well, is it going to heal? And probably not, um, but it doesn't preclude the knee from functioning at its, you know, full potential and not having symptoms. So uh, you can have those little changes there, but may or may not, you know, be detrimental to the function in the long term. Yeah, my current analogy in terms of 
reading an MRI report, whether it's for knees or shoulders or any other part of the body is it's probably like getting an inspection on the house. You might think you've got a perfect house, but when a housing inspector comes, they're going to find lots of little things that you may panic about. It may say your foundation has some early signs of I don't know, I'm not a building inspector, but it may sound really concerning. The reality is, is most of these changes are normal for age and we don't necessarily have to worry about. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through a couple different situations and I want you to tell me what your preferred treatment option is. And with the caveat that you really only have three options that I'm gonna give you. You can okay. observe it and do some physical therapy. You can do a surgery where we clean up the meniscus tear. We don't put any sutures in it. Um, or we can do surgery where we're going to repair them. So first one is a 56 year old with a degenerative posterior horn medial meniscus tear with a complex uh, tear pattern. They're moderately active. They like to run a few times a week. They play pickleball. What is your preferred treatment? Are you asking for your knee? <laughs> Not, is this yet. You? No. Um, Not yet. So most of the time, uh, non-surgical treatment. So observing and in that group, you know, like physical therapy, injection if they need it, anti-inflammatories, but um, mainstay will be non-surgical treatment. Okay. So you said injection. Are you injecting horse tranquilizers, steroids, anti-inflammatories, growth hormone? What is your injection and what do you use it for? Yeah, usually the first line would be a steroid injection. Um, and especially if, um, you know, the knee's irritated, if, um, you know, they're trying to do physical therapy but can't make progress, sometimes that'll reset it. Uh, if they have, you know, temporary symptoms and have some, you know, big trip or event coming up, um, want to get the knee immediately better, um, you, you know, you don't need it. It's not going to heal anything. It's not going to reverse anything. But um, sometimes can just kind of reset the knee, get it feeling better, at least in the short term. Will it mask pain? Like one of the things patients often ask is if I get a steroid injection, I know it's a good pain reliever because it's decreasing inflammation. Does it mask pain and then you can injure yourself worse? Yeah. And, um, I think to some extent it will mask pain. Um, and then I'm not sure, you know, how much that will add to further injury. So, there will definitely be some tears where we don't want to do that, like masking it or, you know, just overlooking it's a bad idea. And then there's other, you know, signs that we'd look at that would say, you know what, this one, um, like continuing with activities that should be okay, um, getting the knee feeling better will overall be beneficial. Um, so it, I don't think it's a huge concern in most cases. Yeah, I think if you have certain types of tears, which we'll get to, or you've talked about the radial tears and the root tears, absolutely. We're just yeah. masking what's going on. And it's an option if you decide not to have surgery. But for most people, you're not masking pain. You're decreasing what your knee is actually feeling. You're decreasing the burden of inflammation. All right, second scenario. You have a 48, well, now 49-year-old male um, comes in with a small flap tear, has already done three months of physical therapy and continues to have pain that's limiting their ability to run more than 500 feet to 1,000 feet without having pain and intermittent swelling. What is your preferred strategy for that patient? Usually the little flaps, um, just the debridement, the cleanup. Um, and it, a lot of it depends on where it's torn, um, what the tear looks like. But, um, you know, in that situation where, you know, after three months, the if it's not getting better, still problematic. Um, it's not like, hey, if we do one more month of PT, this is just going to turn the corner. Um, and then, so I think like a surgical option is, you know, generally pretty good. Um, and then I think, you know, most of us, our goal is always to keep all of the meniscus or most of the meniscus as much as possible. Um, but some of these, the healing potential is just so limited. So if it's a little flap on the inner part of the meniscus where the blood supply isn't very good, um, trimming it can very predictably help while keeping, you know, like 80, 90% of the meniscus. So you're leaving the rest alone and just taking that little tiny bit. Um, and then if you did try to sew it, a lot of those, it, like they won't heal. So now you've got stitches, you still have a tear and then, you know, you may not help. So, um, that can be a, you know, pretty quick, easy surgery, easy recovery, but like very definitively help take care of the whole problem. 
Yeah, I think those are my patients that, thank you. Um, what are you doing on Wednesday morning? <laughs> Just kidding. My knee's fine-ish. Yeah, um, so I think those are the patients that tend to really benefit. And I'm guessing that's kind of what um, Kadarius Tony has. He has a small yeah. flap that every time he um, pivots on his knee may cause some catching and uh, locking in his knee. Um, in general, however, these patients tend not to get all that much better with physical therapy, but there's no downside in trying. I feel like right. oftentimes patients are like, well, I don't want to make it worse. There's no evidence that the, it makes it worse from trying physical therapy. But if you remain symptomatic, especially you really have that joint line tenderness, these are the patients that really, really benefit. All right. Last scenario, you have a 56-year-old patient who comes in, they sort of felt a pop in the back of their knee when they're stepping awkwardly, and they come in with a root tear of the medial meniscus. What is your preferred treatment for this? Um, generally, those will want to fix surgically. So repairing with sutures and the root tear, so it's where the meniscus attaches to the bone in the back. Um, and uh, I like to think of it like almost like a trampoline, like where you, you know, with a trampoline, you push down, it pushes back. And then a root tear is like if you detach a third of it or half of it, like from the rings around the side, and then you push on the trampoline, you just fall right through. There's no like resistive capacity. And that's kind of like the meniscus where you just tear that attachment. And then now it, the whole thing doesn't work. Um, and we know that if you just leave it alone, uh, there's a really high chance that there's progressive arthritis to the point that we can't reverse it. And then people can even be looking towards like a knee replacement, even in like a year or two years from having a very healthy joint to needing knee replacement surgery. Um, and then it's a, um, you know, a surgery also that has been shown to work. So we can sew it back, we can get it to heal and then, you know, avoid that, you know, ongoing degenerative change of the knee. So those are ones that um, I think we'll all be like a little more aggressive with fixing because it it works, it prevents these bigger changes. And then, um, you know, at this point, I think it's a pretty st or more straightforward surgery that, you know, we can get done pretty effectively. Yeah, I think one thing that patients may or may not be aware of is this is a type of meniscus tear pattern we rarely fixed before 2010, 2012. This is something that's relatively new for us to fix. And the results from this are really, really good. So even in patients that aren't great surgical candidates necessarily, they're a little bit uh, more sedentary, a little bit bigger. They tend to do really well yeah. uh, for root tears. Um, so I think we're much more aggressive about fixing these. And the last thing I wanted to address is like, are we treating patients differently than professional athletes? And I think the reality is, is yes, we are. If my job and my paycheck is entirely dependent on me running down the field, cutting and turning or playing basketball, I don't have that ability to take three months off and try physical therapy because that's the entire season. So I think oftentimes patients will say like, I want the treatment that Kadarius Tony got. I want what Jalen Ramsey got. I want what... Ru Nobody actually wants what Russell Westbrook got. Um, but the re reality is, is that if you're not a professional athlete, you have the ability to be treated uh, differently and we can try physical therapy and you can avoid surgery because your paycheck isn't dependent on it. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think, I think Canarius Tony too, that's a, like a great one because, you know, they're like six weeks out from the start of the season. And if he has this like kind of nagging meniscus tear, um, a lot of people, they might get totally better in six weeks. But then for him, if you say, okay, we're going to, you know, try for six weeks and then see what happens. Like now you're operating week one and he's out for four to six weeks of the season. And that, you know, cause if you took that like at the end of the Super Bowl, like maybe, you know, he says, oh, the knee's kind of hurting then. Like I would imagine they would do the exact same thing where it's like, well, let's give it six, eight weeks, try a rehab program, and then we'll see where we are. But it's just like that training camp timeline. Um, it's probably, well, the more predictable way to have you ready mid-September is to just do it right now, recover and be done with it versus dragging our feet and now we're doing it in the middle of the season. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't agree more. 
Um, well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, that was a really interesting talk on meniscus tears. I think it, every time we talk about it, I think it's more and more interesting. And hopefully as more data comes up, we can get more information out to our listeners. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, six to eight weeks, perspectives in medicine. What do you think of this topic? Connect with us now. In addition to finding our contact form, you'll also find our social media links in our entire six to eight weeks episode archive. Help us grow our listenership by liking, subscribing, and sharing everywhere. We're eager to hear from you, and we'll be sending you more great thought-provoking content in less than six to eight weeks.